Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 20th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. I hope everyone had a good summer recess. Um, just to begin with, can I just inform members that Stuart McMillan MSP is joining us today as an observer. Now, the first item on our agenda is to take evidence on the UK Trade Bill from the Right Honourable George Hollingbrae, MP, the Minister of State for Trade Policy, Suzanne Greaves, OBE Trade Bill Manager, Eleanor Weavis, who is the Head of Domestic Portfolio, and Rebecca Hackett, who is the Deputy Director of Policy at the Scottish Office. Now, welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning. I understand it's the Minister's first visit to the Scottish Parliament, and uh, he's at least seen the committee rooms and the lift on the way up, so hopefully he gets a chance to see <laughs> a wider perspective of the building later. It's a fantastic place. Can I ask you, Minister, to make any brief opening remarks you may have? Hi, May. Uh, is it Chairman or Convener? What, what? Yeah. Convener. Convener. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Um, well, I'm pleased to be here. Um, it's fantastic to see the building. I've driven past it uh, a number of times. My son is at Edinburgh University, so Pollock Calls was just around the corner and saw it from a distance on many occasions. Uh, and I'm looking forward to supporting the committee's scrutiny of the Trade Bill. The Bill continues to be a key element of our package of legislation to establish a fully functioning um, uh, to, to be fully functioning for our international trade partners and individuals and businesses across the UK. The UK government wants all parts of the UK to support this bill. We've been very clear from the bill's introduction that elements of this legislation, namely in relation to clauses one and two, do engage the legislative consent process. I note the Scottish government's memorandum on the LCM from December 2017. And since then, the UK government has taken significant strides through its amendments to the trade bill that came forward at report stage, making improvements to the bill and answering many of the concerns that were raised in that memorandum. Despite these amendments, I do acknowledge that the current position of the Scottish government is not to provide an LCM. I'd like to reiterate the government's commitment to engage with the Scottish government, and I remain confident that we will reach a position uh, which this parliament can support. I also welcome the Scottish Government's recent paper making its case for Scotland's role in future trade uh, agreements. My officials will be discussing this uh, with their Scottish counterparts later today. Importantly, the Trade Bill, of course, focuses on transitioning EU deals, not making future arrangements. However, I'd very much like to learn what the Committee thinks are the most important parts of that paper for them. So, um, convener, I look forward to hearing the committee's views on the trade bill and answering your questions over the course of today's session. I just add, finally, sir, that I am relatively new into post. Uh, I will attempt, in all in all cases, to give the political steer that a minister should give. But on some of the technical detail of the bill, you'll, I hope, uh, agree that referring some of the questions to my colleagues might actually give you better information. Okay, I do appreciate that, minister, and thank you very much for your opening remarks. Now. We need to get some th things on the record, obviously, just for the purpose of making sure we cover all the detail. Uh, I recognise that some amendments have already been made, uh, but given that the, a majority of members on this committee and the Scottish Parliament have already recommended that consent is not given to Section 12 powers in the EU Withdrawal Bill, uh, and given some of the things you said about being confident to reaching agreement, uh, why, do you, why does the UK government continue to propose that the same restrictions apply effectively in the powers and clauses one and two of the trade bill? Well, I think it's worth saying that we think it's actually quite unlikely uh, that any of these powers will actually be necessary. Uh, it's, I was discussing with officials a little earlier the sorts of circumstances in which we may find ourselves having to use the concurrent power to put uh, in these areas to, to put something uh, onto the statute book, and, and it is relatively difficult to see it. Now, that doesn't uh, obviate the principle, and I completely understand that, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it, it seems to us quite unlikely that it will be used. Uh, as to the principle itself, um, as far as we are concerned, there are certain areas where the consistency of approach uh, across the UK as a whole is the driving force that we must work with to make sure that when we transition any of these uh, e existing EU trade, uh, trade ag uh, agreements, that that approach uh, is maintained. I hope that, I mean, it, it seems to me that there is still, there is room for negotiation and that we are absolutely committed to carry on talking and cooperating and working with colleagues in, in the Scottish Parliament and officials to try and find our way through this. So when I say I'm confident, I believe that there, there is plenty to talk about still and that we will achieve success, despite the principled objection. Okay, well, Obviously, you, 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 you think there may not be many changes, but 
the bill makes no provision at all for circumstances where the terms of existing trade agreements do change as a result of negotiations, particularly it might be initiated from third countries. Uh, and under current proposals, the devolved administrations won't be involved in these negotiations, which would be conducted by the UK alone. Um, these talking about future trade agreements future, no, so the, or the, continuity the continuity okay grandfather rights rollover uh-huh and um, because that's the, the description effectively you provided in the beginning of Quite what so. the trade bill is about um, they if that was to happen the potential that they could be prolonged uh, and involve trade-offs and obviously in these circumstances you might imagine that people in scotland would have concerns or any impacts on the fishing industry the seafood industry etc now the house of commons international trade committee um, takes a slightly different view from the from the UK government, where they say our evidence strongly suggests that substantive changes will be necessary when EU trade arrangements are rolled over. The government should set out provisions for both extensive parliamentary scrutiny and enhanced involvement of the devolved administrations in situations where, situ where such situations and changes occur. The government must show what it is doing to foster a cross-part departmental approach to the issue of ruling over trade and other trade related agreements and in fully involve the devolved administrations. So can you give us an update about what that involvement will look like, um, what progress is being made and what discussions have already taken place and what might happen in future? So if we just address those comments at a fairly high at top level. First of all, uh, clearly, we made a large number of amendments to the Trade Bill so that, for example, when the new version of the arrangement, uh, whatever that is, is transitioned, um, New Clause 6, as proposed by Jonathan Ginogli, came forward and he said, look, we need to, do, we need to have a great deal more scrutiny upon this. Uh, and I looked at it carefully and the answer was, I think, yes, we did. Uh, what was agreed was that a report would be placed before Parliament... Uh, that would describe the changes that would happen, that were be, that were occurring between the original EU agreement and that that was going to be um, ratified by by the UK. It would also describe, um, or in each of those cases, it would, it would be very clear as to what those changes actually were, where they happened in the agreement, and what their effect was. Any delegated legislation that was to be passed to enact those uh, changes would, in its explanatory memorandum, point to exactly which bit of the report on the transitioned um, arrangement uh, they would affect. This gives the Parliament very clear uh, routes of scrutiny uh, over this particular, um, over any changes, and indeed the, the ability to, to object and to deal with them uh, in the subsequent debates that will happen upon them. Furthermore, each of these will be subject to ratification, and of course, the Parliament is, is capable of delaying that as well through the, through the CRAG uh, process. So we made um, some very real concessions, which I think have improved the bill, made it better. The sponsor of that particular clause, Jonathan Ginogli, agreed that we'd come to a better conclusion about how we would scrutinise these changes. And I think I'd just add on top of that that, of course, it is our intention to alter these as little as possible. The whole point of the uh, trade agreement continuity process is to make sure that we do have these agreements in place for exit day. And I would agree with your analysis. If we try and change too much, it will delay matters. There's absolutely no question about that. And therefore, colleagues should take some comfort from the fact that it's absolutely uh, in the government's interest to ensure that there's as little changes as possible because speed is of the essence. I just wonder if, if, uh, if colleagues wanted to add anything to that. <coughs> No, happy enough. Okay. Well, it may be that change doesn't happen very often, but it may. But, but it also, if if we take the evidence from the International Trade Committee of the House of Commons, there is a prospect that might happen on some occasions. You've described well, Minister, what the process is for the UK government and the UK Parliament. But what I'm not hearing is how the devolved institutions would be involved in that process, how they would be involved in any 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 consultation any discussions about these potential changes? I might ask colleagues in a moment to describe how uh, uh, the access to those papers, but I think I'd be right in saying that they are available, as all parliamentary papers are, to anybody who wishes to access them. Uh, and as this is a reserved competence, 
I, I'm not entirely sure that there is a formal role, at least, for Scottish colleagues. Perhaps Eleanor just wants to fill in a little. Yes. Um, so at an official level, we engage with the Dole administrations on a regular basis. We have a number of forums for this um, through which we update them on the trade agreement continuity work. Um, so that will be the main fora at an official level in which we would, dis would discuss um, any changes that might need to be made to ensure continuity. In addition to that, as the Minister referenced, um, the papers that we're going to lay before Parliament in advance of any SIs being laid would be freely available and the Scottish Parliament um, would be free to review those as they wished. So there will be no formal process of consultation between the UK Government and the Scottish Government or indeed the Scottish Parliament if there are changes to these trade arrangements that already exist. Is that what there will be no formal process? So the process will be at a, a, an official level, as we have um, described. Um, in addition, as the minister referenced, this is this is a technical process. We are making technical changes to those trade agreements to ensure that they make sense in a bilateral um, context. Can I well, also, also say, uh, Kavina, that, that all of these arrangements have been in place by definition, because we can't transition anything that isn't already on the books, have been in place for some time. Uh, they have been tried and tested. They have been ratified by, by Parliament. Uh, they, their texts have been available for a long time. Uh, and I just re-emphasise one more time that it is absolutely not in our interests to vary these uh, arrangements greatly. Uh, there may be opportunities in the future to renegotiate with partners as and when time allows and things are settled down. But continuity is all about giving certainty to our businesses, to consumers, to politicians, and anybody who needs to understand the process that what we will have in place is pretty much exactly what we have in place now. So this process has already been gone through once in detail, uh, and therefore it, it seems to us that a light-touch approach, modifying as little as possible, putting this through Parliament, making sure everybody understands what has changed, which will be evident to anybody who wants to read the documents, is the right way forward here. If we were looking to change huge issues of ground principle in each of these, on any of these agreements, then a question might arise, but we absolutely do not intend to do that. Well, I'm pressing you on that, Mark, because, I mean, the, the International Trade Committee, the House of Commons, has a different perspective to you. Others, I know around the table, have a different perspective that changes may be required that are substantial. And if we're talking about um, systems that already exist, the Concordat between the UK Government and the Scottish Government states that the UK Government recognises that devolved administrations will have an interest in international policy making in relation to devolved matters, also an, an obligations touching on devolved matters that the UK may agree as a result of concluding international agreements. So the, the thrust of involving the devolved administrations is already part of the architecture. It may not be specifically part of the architecture of the of existing trade deals, but it's part of the architecture of agreements between the government and the UK and the Scottish government. And I've got to say, I, I would be personally disappointed if there was no formal mechanism recognising that there's a role for the Scottish government and the Scottish parliament if and when any changes to trade um, arrangements were to be brought forward. Um, I think that would be a weakness, um, not just for Scotland, but for the UK. So, well, I, I'm very happy to confirm to the committee that is noted, clearly. Um, I'm absolutely clear also, that as far as future trade uh, arrangements are concerned, and you may well move, want to move on this, uh, onto this in a separate section, so I shan't yeah. try and anticipate too much, uh, but I'm absolutely clear that the uh, devolved parliaments and assemblies should be very clearly involved. Uh, and I absolutely hear what you say as a matter of principle. I think our difference here is, you take the word of the International Trade Committee about the fact that there will be substantial changes. I believe that there will not be substantial changes. I don't believe it's in our interest, and I believe time uh, mitigates against it. Uh, and therefore, I think there is not, there will be little to discuss other than the fact that what we largely had before is going to be had again, but with UK substituted for EU. Okay. Is there any we've got to, we've got a supplementary here, Willie? <coughs> Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning, Minister. It's just on the same point, if you don't mind, we, we already have an agreed concordat relating to the coordination of EU policies, and it's actually set out in the Memorandum of Understanding, and it says this quite clearly. The UK Government wishes to involve Scottish Ministers as directly and fully as possible in decision-making on EU matters which touch on devolved areas, including policy formulation, negotiation and implementation 
I say to you again, it's what you've just said a moment ago, not backtracking on that already. I don't believe so. I mean, I, 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 I just like Alan to, to elucidate a little on how we are fulfilling what is promised in that concordat and, and memorandum. There are a, a large number of meetings have occurred on trade policy on how we all work together on that. But I'd like Eleanor, if she can, just to tell to, to give the committee some view of how many meetings there have been and what we intend to do in the future. Um, yep, so we have a number of mechanisms through which we're engaging the devolved administrations on our future trade policy um, following a deep dive that we had with them um, before the summer. Um, we have a series of um, that occur roughly monthly of technical policy roundtables to discuss um, UK trade policy in detail. Um, and, and to en enable the devolved administrations to feed in their views and expertise um, upstream in the policy development process. In addition to that, we have um, a six-weekly six senior officials meeting that reviews um, kind of the devolved administration's um, role in trade in, in addition to kind of cross-cutting issues such as discussions on the bill. Um, in addition to that, um, we and teams across Trade Policy Group um, engage with their um, counterparts in the Scottish Government on a regular basis. Um, indeed, um, after this meeting, um, we're having a series of meetings with the Scottish Government, um, both on their future role in trade agreements, but also on the upcoming consultations um, and how they can best feed into those. But can you, can you give any examples of how the devolved administrations have shaped the policy formulation which perhaps you didn't propose initially. Could you give us any examples of that? Um, so um, I'm, I'm sure we can um, find some examples. Um, those would be at a technical policy level for the policy leads that work on um, the trade agreements themselves. So I, I'd need to return to the committee. Um, but I know um, colleagues have had a number of very interesting discussions with um, with our colleagues in the in the Scottish government um, about you know the detailed um, policy that goes into forming a UK position for trade agreements. I've got other supplementaries in this area, James. Yeah. Um, so just to give a kind of practical example and to explore the, what you're actually saying here, uh, in terms of the locus of the Scottish Parliament and Scottish ministers, in Scotland there are 467,000 people who earn below the, the living wage. Um, that's far too high. I think that'd be a view shared across the Parliament and we would want to use any levers at our disposal to bring that figure down. So if new trade agreements were being set up in the future, and part of that trade agreement involved Scottish public bodies uh, in purchasing goods or services, uh, would there be a facility under the new trade agreement uh, for the devolved administrations to mandate their, their own public bodies to pay the living wage? Well, the, the, the provisions in the Trade Bill about the GPA sign us back up to the obligations we already have uh, as members of the EU. Uh, and, I, and I'm very happy for officials to intervene if I, if I misspeak. Uh, but in essence, that means that we have access, or British companies, Scottish companies, Welsh companies, Irish companies, sorry, Northern Irish companies, have access to £1.3 trillion worth of international procurement opportunities. On the other hand, it also means that we are relatively limited in the way we can shape the procurement policy that we use at home. It has to be open, it has to be transparent, it has to be understandable, and it has to be accessible to all who come, who come to use it. So I don't think I'm going to particularly comment on the individual example that you give, but if a particular policy was to be applied, it would have to be compliant with the rules around the GPA. So are you then saying that uh, in terms of Scottish devolved, in terms of devolved administrations, uh, we're not a able to exempt and pl apply a specific policy where Scottish public bodies are involved in procurement activities under a new trade agreement. Okay, I think we're slightly talking at cross purposes. I'm concentrating concentrating on the provisions in the trade bill, uh, and I'm absolutely clear that the procurement agreement will be the same as we have had. In, in essence, we will simply be individual <coughs> single members ourselves. Uh, and I believe that Scottish institutions already have legislated for and made policy decisions about how they do that sort of procurement. Um, but I think if, if, if uh, colleagues have any further notes on that. Mm. Yeah, um, 
so it's it's obviously worth noting that we're as as a member of the EU part of the government procurement agreement now, which um, which we've signed up to, um, and sets the rules around procurement policies. Um, and under the trade bill, we're going to um, continue our membership of that as an independent trading partner. So nothing is changing. And just so to just to readdress it, there would like, uh, perhaps is your question, which is in future trade arrangements, yeah, would sorry. Scottish. Uh, authorities be able to take on a different role or different set of policies in how they procure and what, what it, uh, and so on and so forth. I, I would say these agreements will be mandated. Well, they will be agreed at a UK level, uh, and therefore I would have thought that the the policy in the free trade agreement as agreed at a UK level will apply to all public authorities across the UK. So if the if the Scottish Parliament and the St Scottish public bodies took a different view. Uh, the UK view would would override that. Is that what you're saying? I, you know, I think it will entirely depend on. I don't know, do, do stand in if you need to. But uh, for example, in the EU Japan um, free uh, trade agreement that was re recently signed, there was a whole chapter on the procurement from local authorities. Now, this may not be directly relevant, but just to give you a flavour, some local authorities had, de had decided they did not want to be included in this and were not included in the free trade agreement, and some uh, concluded that they did. Now, that's an example of where there are variations across the piece. It's a different country with different relationships, and it gives no great indications as to how we treat things here. But what I'm th I think what I'm saying to you is it will depend on the free trade agreement and how it is struck. The GPA is wholly separate from that, uh, and is ex we're just replicating. So if we're talking about procurement in general, we are replicating what the arrangement we already have with the EU, uh, other than changing technical details uh, and using the delegated powers where necessary to do accessions uh, and people coming in and out of the arrangement. Um, I, I think it will be pretty much as experienced previously. Okay. Uh, uh, Minister, some members inevitably will, will ask wider questions than just a trade bill, but I think we all, we all no, understand no. that this bill is about rollover issues and grandfather yeah. rights, etc., and existing arrangements. Yeah, understood. So. Patrick, do you want to do, it's probably the right time to raise scrutiny issues at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good morning. Um, following on from some of that and, and also picking up on the, the comments you made about changes uh, in relation to parliamentary scrutiny. Um, and it's right that this does cover the, the issues immediately in the trade bill, but also the longer term approach to trade policy and the, the UK government's commitment to work with the devolved administrations on both of those fronts, uh, and in, in particular in, in your uh, preparing for future trade policy document, it says you remain committed to working with the devolved administrations, not only on your approach to the implementation of new trade agreements, but also as well as the role they will play in helping to shape the UK's future trade policy. There are two levels to this. One is about the extent to which the UK government will work with the devolved administrations, and the other is the extent to which parliamentary scrutiny is brought to bear on both levels of government. Um, would you agree that, in general, what you're talking about, if we're going to be consistent with those commitments, is the idea that trade policy uh, and some of the, the, the immediate decisions in relation to, to continuity and, and rollover and so on are shared responsibilities? and therefore that both governments have to have a mechanism by which they can decide and express clearly whether an agreement has been reached, whether an approach is agreed, uh, and uh, both parliaments have the ability to say no. Okay. Um, the Scotland Act 1998, it makes it pretty plain, I think, that conduct of international issues, particularly on trade, and specifically identified on trade, are reserve matters. So whilst there is absolutely no doubt that Scotland has an interest in trade and in promoting it and influencing uh, UK government policy upon it, and that is right, quite right and proper, I don't think it has, according to the Scotland Act 98, and perhaps I should call Rebecca in here at some stage, uh, a formal role where it can set trade policy for the UK. The UK is the, is the body that does that. Uh, that's my understanding, and happy to be contradicted. No, indeed. I'm, I'm not saying that the devolved administrations set trade policy, but your position, the UK government's position, uh, is that the devolved administrations will play a role in helping to shape the UK's future trade policy. So could you tell us what role that will be and how it will operate in practice? Well, that, that is a matter... Uh, as we've already heard, there is extensive discussion uh, at official level 
uh, about the UK's trade policy as it uh, emerges and as it evolves uh, with the devolved authorities. We absolutely take those uh, discussions very seriously and points that are made will be incorporated as appropriate into the policies which we bring forward. Uh, it's also, of course, entirely proper for the Scottish Parliament to have debates uh, on any issue which it, it wishes to, including trade policy. Uh, and I've no doubt that those would be noted uh, in the UK Parliament as well. So there are many mechanisms there. Uh, and I absolutely confirm to you that it is the Department's clear intent and desire to take the concerns of the Scottish Government and the other devolved authorities extremely seriously uh, on trade policy, because plainly there are very important in, uh, industries in Scotland, very important issues which are clearly, um, it is clearly right that the UK Government takes into account. We'll continue the official level contacts uh, as to be as deep and as long as, uh, as they can, such that we do shape our overall trade policy such that it reflects the interests of the devolved authorities. Can I just reflect to you some of the evidence that we've heard so far? Uh, Professor uh, Rawlings uh, told us that the uh, the UK government's new board of trade treats the devolved administrations just like any other stakeholder. This is very much a top-down approach which sends a negative set of messages. And the, the Scottish government um, has, uh, has said that the UK government's approach to trade policy appears to place the interests uh, and involvement of the devolved nations on a par with sectoral interests. And that approach must change. If, if that's the perception of the level of involvement and, and seriousness that's, that's being taken to this, then we've got a problem and something has to change, right? I, I'm afraid I just... An impression it may be does not reflect the reality. Uh, we have talked... On, I, I just reiterate the reply I gave earlier. There's been huge amounts of engagement with the Scottish Government and, and uh, officials uh, on trade policy. There will be a great deal more. We continue to evolve and think through our approach to trade policy and its relevance to devolved authorities and how we engage on that. Uh, and we, can, we, we are thinking very clearly uh, about the, the devolved authorities' roles and how we bring the expertise that no doubt exists here and working very closely with the Parliament to make sure that we exploit that expertise, get those views uh, and make sure they are incorporated into UK-wide policy. So the impression may be from one or two commentators that this is not happening. My impression from what I hear about the engagement is that it very definitely is. Okay, so you don't see any, any need to change the approach that's being taken? Uh, I think that the approach should always evolve, should always improve. We should always look to do things differently if, we can, if it can create better results. Small one. Just, just finally, and this one does look uh, further ahead to the, the, the longer-term approach to the development of uh, potential future trade agreements, um, one of the serious themes of evidence that we've had is about democratic scrutiny of that process. Uh, and if we look at the, the level of democratic scrutiny that's existed in the European Parliament, which obviously will no longer apply um, if Brexit goes ahead, a uh, huge amount of public campaigning around <coughs> concerns about the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, that was effective campaigning, and the European Parliament was able to reflect that and prevent uh, the, the things that, that people were concerned about from happening. Um, what level of democratic scrutiny, of parliamentary scrutiny, and I would talk about multiple parliaments here, uh, is necessary to ensure that people power can have the same role in future. Does it involve parliaments signing off negotiating mandates, uh, having scrutiny of draft texts, uh, ultimately approving uh, uh, trade agreements rather than ministers doing that uh, and, and reporting their decisions? Well, just to re-emphasise, uh, Kavina, that uh, this remains involved. Uh, so this remain, remains a UK competence. That it remains part of the royal, the royal prerogative is used to sign off these treaties, uh, and there is no intention to change that position. As for democratic accountability, the ability of people to shape what free trade deals look like, the Secretary of State is extremely clear that one of the problems with TTIP was that it wasn't widely explained. There wasn't a huge amount of ability to address key interests, address, address key issues uh, that people and the problems that people had with it, and that if we were going to have a system in this country, it was going to be much more widely accessible, that the public would be generally consulted, and we're in the middle one just starting that off today here in Scotland, um, that we're going to run a 14-week consultation period when people from any walk of life, any background, any age, uh, any part of the country can put in their views as to what we should be doing with the four potential free trade agreements 
uh, that we are proposing to move forward with. We are also holding, as you know, lots of um, actual direct roundtables and consultation groups with uh, people and regions across the country. And the whole, the, whole reason, the whole reason I come to this is because people will be able to shape what they think, uh, well, they will have much better knowledge of and shape the agreement before it becomes uh, set down into a framework. Forgive me, that's all nice to have, but yep. will they be able to call on their MP to vote no if they feel that the outcome is not in their interests? I think the honest answer to that is that the ratification process does provide uh, for this change in 2010, for the CRAG process to be delayed, in fact indefinitely. So there are very, very serious concerns uh, about the shape of the free trade agreement and sufficient numbers of MPs agree, then yes, that, that can be achieved. But what we're looking for here is to produce an agreement that everybody can agree upon. Uh, and we are putting in place a, a mechanism by which we feel we can make sure that all the benefits of a free trade agreement are made plain, that people can feed in where they have concerns, that those can shape the actual framework around which we negotiate. We will report to the UK Parliament on a regular basis. We'll be reporting directly into the International Trade Committee as well. Uh, there'll be regular, there will be regular parliamentary opportunities uh, upon the free trade uh, uh, proposals. So we believe that there is a level of democratic accountability here where people can see what is going on, whilst at the same time retaining the UK government's ability to sign free trade agreements. Thank you. Kim. Okay, Adam Tonkins. So, I mean, just to pick direct, up directly on that last point, um, Minister, if I may, um, uh, when you say the CRAG arrangements, what you mean is the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act, which placed what I think used to be called the Ponsonby Rule on a statutory footing, which significantly enhances the role of the United Kingdom Parliament, effectively to hold the United Kingdom government to account for what it agrees um, in any international um, uh, agreement or treaty, not, not, not uniquely I I in trade agreements. And, 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 that, that, and that's the ability that the UK Parliament has, as I think you just said, indefinitely to delay um, the ratification by the Crown of uh, international instruments that the United Kingdom Parliament has problems with. Uh, indeed, I think that's it also very clearly counterpoints with where the EU is moving yeah. uh, on, on this, where indeed. we now have competence at the EU. These are EU-only agreements from now on in pretty much ex-investor uh, protection uh, arrangements. And therefore, what, we're, what we are proposing here is certainly superior to that. If you compare it with the previous arrangements, it's, I suppose, ratification was an issue there as well, and, and it could be delayed, but now the EU is quite clearly moving towards something completely different. And so the UK arrangements, I think, provide opportunity for the input that we need to shape. They provide opportunity to scrutinise on a regular basis and see where we are with, uh, in terms of the negotiations and how those are being changed. And at ratification, when we have a final agreement, we still have an opportunity to act, or parliamentarians still have an opportunity actually to infinitely delay the ratification of a treaty if they object sufficiently. And, and in that process, in that very important process of parliamentary accountability of the United Kingdom government, Scotland, as such, is represented by the 59 MPs Indeed. that Scotland elects to the House of Commons. Because we are, we are talking, as you've said a number of times, I think completely correctly, um, we are talking here about um, competences which are reserved to the United Kingdom Parliament. Quite so, and, and it's, it's, it's just key to remember that, the, you know, the, that Scotland has its fair representation in there and there have been any number of debates on all of these topics uh, on which Scottish MPs uh, have made their opinions very well known and looked after their sectoral interests, looked after their consumer interests, looked after their political interests and told, us, told the UK Parliament precisely what they think. So, and indeed many mem amendments were put forward and put down regularly uh, by members, uh, Scottish members of the UK Parliament. So, and as I'm sure you would expect, they are an effective group of people and highly successful campaigners. Uh, so I would trust them to be able to shape rules, regulations, shape FTAs in ways that suit Scotland. Absolutely. Um, uh, the, the, it's, the, it's been the very strongly expressed view of this committee minister, and it's certainly the view of my uh, party, that um, Brexit can and must be delivered compatibly with the United Kingdom's devolution settlements. Um, and that means, I think, that not only that devolved competence must be respected, uh, but also that reserved competence must be respected. And that, that's also the view, I take it, of the United Kingdom government. It certainly is. Yeah. So there's no sense in which Brexit can somehow return the United Kingdom to a constitution that we had you know, before we joined the European Union in 1972 when there was no legislative devolution in Scotland or Wales. Quite so. And I think it's just right to reflect at this, at this particular stage that the Scottish Government will become for responsible for a great deal more than it has been responsible before upon uh, the moment of Brexit. Indeed. Uh, and whilst we can discuss uh, the you know, Section 12 and, and, and the issues around that, 
uh, large amounts of competence is going to be given to the Scottish Parliament that did not previously exist. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's the constitutional starting point um, that, you know, that we are talking here about reserved competence and we're talking here about competences, therefore, in which Scotland's interests are represented principally by the 59 MPs that it elects to the House of Commons. But the United Kingdom government has consistently said ever since the EU referendum that in the management of this process, both the Scottish government and the Scottish Parliament will have roles to play in helping to shape policy and in helping to hold that um, policy making process to account, notwithstanding the fact that we are talking about something which is essentially reserved to Westminster rather than devolved to this parliament. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah. There is a, an absolute appetite at all stages in all of this to make sure that the settlement that was reached uh, when the Scottish devolved powers were brought in in, 19, in, in 1998 are respected uh, and that as far as possible the, the devolved authorities must be brought with us as we reach this, this, pro this uh, process reaches its conclusion. So to do so would I think just, uh, would, would would undoubtedly would, would create problems, would create difficulties, would create objections uh, and uh, that must be dealt with. You said, I think, in your um, opening remarks, Minister, that you'd only been in post for uh, a, a matter of weeks. But within that time frame, how, how's that process going? What's your, what's your reflection, your immediate reflection on, on how the process of engagement with the Scottish Government is, is going? We've heard from your officials that there's very meaningful and very frequent um, uh, engagement at official level. What about at ministerial level? Well, one of the first, in fact, the first visit uh, I, I did uh, in my role was uh, and in one day to be in Leeds, but uh, later in that day to be up here in Glasgow uh, uh, meeting with Mr. McKay. Who, who, sorry. Okay. Derek McKay. Okay. Yeah. No, not Derek. <laughs> it's Ivan, Ivan McKee. Oh, Ivan McKee, yeah. So I do apologise, just a slight brain fade there. Um, and so, uh, yes, so I have been up here. Uh, I'm here again today. Um, there's been any amount of engagement, as you've, uh, we've already discussed at some length, between the officials. Uh, I actually believe that the, we can up the level of that and there's more to do. We continue to think very carefully about how we um, deal with, how we, how we negotiate with, how we work with and cooperate with colleagues uh, in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and I think we can make improvements to it, as I've already alluded to. There's more, there's more that can be done. Um, uh, we, can sit, we continue to think about how we can improve this process and how we can make it better and how we can reach agreement with colleagues as best we can. Perhaps, Rebecca, anybody else want to add anything more to that? Well, just to refer to the fact that there are, um, I suppose, in addition to the 59 MPs that, um, that Scotland has in Westminster in terms of the process of the UK government, you have the territorial secretaries of state who um, are representing the interests of the um, devolved nations as policy is made. So the, the Scotland office is actively involved in, in the process of developing the policy. Um, it, institutions that have been um, re-established, like the Board of Trade, you have the uh, territorial secretaries of state participating in those meetings and devolved um, businesses from devolved nations involved in those. But in addition to this, there is a review of intergovernmental relations um, underway. So the UK government is working with the devolved administrations to look at how the, how the uh, structures that we have can be reformed to, uh, to respond to the new challenges post-EU exit. Um, when might that review complete? I think it's, it's going on over the course of the year, so it's it's progressing um, with a view to uh, further discussions later in the year, and then um, perhaps new arrangements being being ready for um, EU exit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, that's been quite a useful look around the architecture of how the UK works in the, these issues. Um, in our interim report on the EU withdrawal bill, we noted the Concord Concordat on International Relations. And I just want to see where this fits into this discussion we're having. Because that says quite clearly that it promises cooperation on exchanging information, formulating UK po foreign policy, negotiating treaties and implementing treaty obligations. It also provides for ministers and officials of the devolved governments to form part of UK treaty negotiating teams and for apportioning any qualitative treaty, apportioning any qualitative treaty obligations. Do you see a role for, um, in that way in future for devolved administrations, and as is already lined out, laid out in the Concord that, that already exists? Uh, I think the answer, answer to that, uh, Irina, is I, I rule absolutely nothing out. It's clearly there in the document already. Um, as part of the process that Rebecca uh, was just outlining, um, all of these issues are being considered, and I don't think uh, I can go any further than that at the moment. Okay. 
Murdo, did you want to still cover GPA mm -hmm. issues on your account? Yeah, thank you, um, Convener. Um, Minister, my, my colleague James Kelly touched on some of these procurement issues um, earlier, but I just wanted to follow up on a couple of points. Um, Clause 1 of the Bill deals with the power to implement the agreement on public procurement, which is a voluntary agreement between 19 WTO members, including the EU. But the Bill doesn't appear to address the process via which the UK will become a signatory to the GPA or the role, if there is a role, of the devolved administrations in such a process. Are you able to tell us a bit more about how that process will work in practice? Actual application at WTO DTO level? Yeah. Uh, that one I'm definitely going to reserve, refer to officials, if you don't mind, as long as we've got someone here who can respond. Um, no, in which case, no, if, if you may, yeah. uh, I think it, w that, is, that will require a very precise okay. uh, answer. And if I may, we will write to you with a, with a reply. Okay, thank you. That's, that's fine, Convener. Can, can I just ask one follow-up, just to put this in, in a little bit of context? And, and this is more about future trade policy than it is about what we're discussing today. But if you listen to some of the commentary around these issues, you'll often see it claimed that, for example, future trade policy will lead to the National Health Service in Scotland being sold off to American uh, multinational companies, or we'll all be force-fed chlorinated chicken, which will then become part of the food chain. Can, can, can you give us some assurance as to whether these claims have any basis in fact? It simply comes from the fact that the American market is different from the UK market. And I suspect that a great many people around this table have actually been to the United States and therefore have probably consumed products that have some of these uh, the, these items in them. Um, the, the UK is absolutely clear that we will not be dropping our phytosanitary standards, we will not be dropping our food standards. These are things which we will not be negotiating away in any free trade deal. Um, as to how it could be dealt with, uh, within a free trade deal itself, that will all be a matter for negotiation. These have, there are off offensive interests, there are defensive interests. If there are some things you refuse to accept, there are other things you may have to give, and all that in the end will come out in the wash. Uh, I think it's right that people express their concerns uh, about free trade deals. I think it's right that if they have particular issues which they want included, they make those plain to us, and people should write to us and during the consultation go online and do that. At the same time, I think it's also right that we should seek to deal with any misinformation that's out there. Uh, and it is not true to say that any free trade trade deal will end up creating issues for the National Health Service. In all of the trade deals we strike, those are they, it's the right to shape public policy is absolutely clearly protected uh, and will be so in the future, and we will not be signing any free trade deals that don't have that protection in it. It is right for government to be able to control how it provides health care for the nation. Uh, and uh, investor state dispute settlements and so on and so forth pushed to one side, the UK will not be signing agreements that allow the National Health Service to be challenged by foreign investors. Likewise, um, any of these sort of uh, food issues, any of uh, these can be dealt with in these agreements, and we've made very clear commitments uh, about how we will deal with those issues. Okay, that's very clear. Thank, Thank you. you. I can yeah. perhaps, um, if yes. it might help, I can perhaps answer the question about the um, UK joining the GPA in, yeah. its, own, in its own right now. Um, so as the Minister explained, this allows us to have access to a huge market for public procurement, and it's both in the UK's interest and indeed on the other members of the Government Procurement Agreement um, for us to join. Um, we very much want to join on the same terms as we are at the moment, and if, um, and if the other members agree to that, and as I say, it's in their interest as well, um, then the, um, the agreement would be ratified and um, Parliament would have an, uh, an opportunity, if it wishes to do so, to consider that under the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act, um, which we referred to earlier. Yeah, thank you. But just for the avoidance of doubt, this is simply the, the UK replacing its membership via the EU with direct membership, so there will be no substantial change. That is to absolutely the correct. Yes, okay. that's absolutely correct. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Could I just ask whether that answers the question sufficiently that we don't need to write? I just I don't want to yeah. waste any officials' time doing something that's not necessary. So if you're content with that that's, answer, that, well, that's fine for me, Convener. Well, I'm con if you're content, I'm content. Right. Okay. Well, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> James, you still get any other issues in GPA? Oh, right, right. Yes, in sir. which case, we'll go to Emma and PGI issues. Yes, OK. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming today. I'm interested in um, geographical indications of protected foods, and uh, under the protected food scheme, a named food or drink will be given legal protection from um, bogus imitations. So in, in the UK, there's about 86 PGIs, 
And there's actually 18 for cheese, one for Orkney and one for Ayrshire, Dunlop cheese, so we've got two in Scotland. Um, the EU want to continue with the PGI status, and uh, my understanding is that that's great, they want to continue, but that the UK government does not. So why not? OK, so I think I'm going to need that question fleshing out a little. So plainly not trade bill issue, uh, which I'm absolutely content with, Karina. I'm, I'm not saying it's not. Uh, GIs um, are a complex area. They, can say they pr present quite serious difficulties in, in free trade negotiations because some nations out there just regard them as, as, as unfair protection of, tra uh, of non-tariff barriers to trade. Could you just explain for me a little what this is the EU, EU has said about Ayrshire cheese and in what circumstance? As far as I'm aware that the EU is quite happy to continue to assign protected status for certain products. Uh -huh. For instance, our Scotch beef, Scotch lamb, the welfare of our animals is, uh, is different than maybe American beef. And I mean, you commented, I used to live in America and I stopped eating beef when I started looking after patients who presented uh -huh. with Kruschfeldt's Jakob's disease. So I think when we're looking at the difference in the welfare of the products, um, we have great products, our beef, our lamb, and uh, our Scotch salmon, and of course our whisky. So the issue is, why can't we just make that a, a done deal and accept and protect the geographical indication status of our good provenance? Okay, and, and again, please, official, this is... This, uh, it, I know this is not part of this I realise it might have to, have to come back to us, but... We, we please, might do, but just my general impression is that, A, um, as, as I said, some countries regard these as, as non-tariff uh, non barriers to trade. B, do we think they're important? Yes, we do. Uh, there is absolutely no question that the likes of Scotch whisky have to carry some sort of GI with them because they're easily counterfeited, they need to be protected. It's a very, very, very important export for the United Kingdom, let alone Scotland. Uh, and we believe that there, is, you know, there, there are very clear areas uh, of other interests, sectoral interests, where that also applies. Now, we also have to count, I just, I just have to set that around a little bit and say that in most free trade deals, certainly ones I've looked at recently anyway, you have to demonstrate a certain level of penetration into market and or desire uh, amongst consumers for that GI to, to gain protection. So on the whole, quite a few UK GIs which we promote fail that test when going to the Japanese market or say the South Korean market. Whiskey, <laughs> no problem at all. Amazingly, uh, blue and white Stilton actually quite often get through. Uh, but there are several others which we would, you would like to protect that just don't have sufficient market penetration to warrant GI status in that market. And, and we come across that. that. So, so the GI issue is not a particularly straightforward one. Um, I think if I can, we'd, I'd, I'd like someone just to have a quick word with you afterwards, if I may, just to get a slightly better feel for exactly what the question is so we can answer it properly uh, by reply and letter, if that, if that would suit you. Sure, OK. Yeah. Um, Alex, you've got issues on the common frameworks. <clears throat> I just wonder if after, you know, after the summer uh, recess whether you could uh, give us maybe give us an update on how the common frameworks have been developing uh, and how you feel they'll interact with trade negotiations uh, and if there's any timetable you were able to share with us either now or by correspondence. This is definitely one. Yeah, this is definitely one for Rebecca. And I, I, well, I, think, <laughs> I think also, it's, it's also, I think I'm right in saying, and I'm, please tell me if I'm wrong, I think the Secretary of State for Scotland is appearing in front of you tomorrow. Uh, it may be a, a question that is better directed there for a fuller answer, but I'm, I'm sure Rebecca can help a little. Yes, I mean, I think essentially the, um, the frameworks negotiations are, are ongoing and the, the deep dives that Elena referred to earlier in the discussions with the devolved administrations are forming part of that, um, that process. So I think there is a lot of intensive work underway um, and the Secretary of State uh, will be very happy to talk about the detail of that tomorrow. I look, I look forward to tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, is it, did you have a supplementary there, Patrick? Uh, no, I want to ask one, one last question at the end, if that's okay, possible. No problem. I've got another couple of folk I need to get in. Anyway, Willie, I think you had areas of the Trade Remedies Authority, which I think is part of the bill. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks very much again, convener. Um, I mean, as you know, this, this uh, body of individuals will be set up to, to look at issues involving trade and so on and fo so forth. But inevitably, Minister, they're, they're bound to intersect in issues of devolved competence. They're, it's bound to happen. Uh, how, how can you therefore ensure that the interests of all devolved administrations, not just Scotland, will be properly represented on that body. Okay, this, I, this is an area where I have very firm views. Um, it is absolutely essential 
that the Trade Remedies Authority is seen to be independent, to have no sectoral interest, to have no specific interest of any kind uh, represented on its board. Why? Because those outside the system, those who are making representations to it, those who are demanding restitution from it, those who are trying to resist that restitution have to have absolute confidence that it is independent and does not reflect interest of any one sort at all, whether it's sectoral, whether it is country-based, whatever it is. Now, that does not mean to say that somebody from Scotland cannot be on the board. Of course they can. But what they have to be is somebody who takes an impartial view based upon the evidence from across the UK, because these are cross-UK measures, uh, and, and I'm absolutely clear that we should be choosing people by merit on their interest in doing the job, because it would be hard and technical, in their ability and background that allows them to take the sorts of view and uh, conduct the sort of analysis and understand the sort of evidence that they'll be presented with in a reasonable and rational fashion, uh, preferably with a background in, in the area, but it is by no means required but they are people who can take an absolutely clear view. If they cannot, we will not have trust in the authority. We will have disputes, we will have people petitioning, saying that the board that made the decision had narrower views in mind rather than the straightforward policy which government had set for the TRA to follow. So I'm absolutely clear that no narrow group or narrower group uh, should, whether it's a devolved authority and or a sexual interest, should be directly represented of and chosen by an author a, 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 a body to be on that board. But will we at least ensure, though, that whoever is successful in being on the board does have knowledge, skills about the devolved administrations and the shared competencies that we have? Um, I, I think I'm reluctant to even go that far. I am not reluctant to say that the devolved authorities absolutely will be taking into uh, views, sectoral interests, uh, all of the technical data that is needed uh, to make any of these judgments in a reasonable, rational, sensible and timely fashion will be taken in by the authority itself, not the board, but the, the, the chief executive and his or her staff. Uh, and that is the place for those interests to make their representations. The job of the board is to decide whether or what whether the decision that is being made is the correct one based on the evidence. The evidence itself, all those, the evidence that all those interests, the devolved authorities and such interests can provide, should be provided in the, uh, as information to the authority upon which to base their judgment. Now, of course, on top of all of that, there sits the economic interest test. So that if, for whatever reason, a decision comes out that fits the various metrics and rubrics that are provided to the authority to calculate damages, to calculate... The, um, the lesser duty rule and so on and so forth, but it looks like the decision produced by that metric is somewhat perverse, the economic interest test can look more closely about uh, at geographical weightings, about effects on particular communities, and it can modify and indeed annul or object the uh, recommendation uh, that goes up to the board. So geographic, uh, ge geographic um interests uh, or devolved uh, authority interests can play a part in the economic interest too which will provide should provide a second level of uh, satisfaction of comfort that narrower geographical uh, consequences of potential trade remedies that might be applied or indeed damage that's been caused will be properly represented so you could have people serving on that board who have an influence on about devolved issues and trade disputes who themselves know nothing about the devolved competencies that they're dealing with and perhaps adjudicating on? Um, I suppose theoretically that's possible. Um, I would suggest to you that the sorts of people who are sitting on this board, and I suspect the position in which they find themselves and the knowledge that they will require, suggests that they'll be only too well aware of devolved competencies and those sorts of issues because they, they are the sorts of people who will be recruiting to do that job. Do they, will they formally be required to know those things? Possibly not. Are they extremely likely to have real appreciations of them and understanding of them? The very job they are doing will expose them to that day in, day out. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. That, that was helpful. In terms of the establishment of the, the TRA, the Secretary of State, I think, said he's looking forward to working with the devolved administrations on the establishment and operation of the TRA to ensure their views and interests are taken into account. How are you going about that? And again, there's been huge amounts of discussion with officials, I believe, and I'm, I'm, since Ellen is having the discussions largely, I'm, I'm going to defer to her 
to uh, discuss I think, in a bit more detail. Yeah, um, so it's actually it's my trade remedies colleagues who are having these discussions um, with the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish governments, and those are ongoing about how the Dole administrations will be engaged throughout the trade remedies process itself. Okay. I'll get a chance to ask Mike Russell just very shortly just what that really means. I mean, I I, 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 perhaps add something. Um, obviously, there's the, the, the trade bill actually sets up the Trade Remedies Authority yep. and provides the governance structure. And, of course, that's about the efficient sort of operation, operation of that body. Yep. Um, there is also a separate piece of legislation, the Taxation Cross-Border Trade Bill, which sets out the framework under which the authority will operate. And that is where the that is legislating for the economic interest test. And obviously, when the Trade Remedies Authority is looking at an investigation into any particular issue, it will want to consider what the impact of that is across the whole of the UK and would want to investigate if there are any particular impacts in particular areas, including if that is in, in any of the devolved nations. Uh, and if there is, it will be looking to get evidence to that so that when it comes to making the recommendation, it will take into account all of the factors that might influence wherever that might be in the UK. Okay. Um, Neil? Uh, thank you, Kimbina. Good morning, Minister. Um, there's a huge amount of concern by, uh, out there amongst businesses, trade unions, about the possible impact of a no-deal uh, Brexit, particularly the impact of a shortage of goods on manufacturers, suppliers and consumers. In that event, what are the types of good, goods that the UK government believes are likely to be a shortage of in the event of a no-deal Brexit? And are any of these likely to affect the Scottish economy disproportionately compared to the rest of the UK? Um, Convener, I think the, the honest, uh, the straightforward answer to that is that this, these are questions that should be directed at, at, at uh, Dexu, uh, who are much more likely to be better positioned than, than I am to talk about that. Uh, we're talking about future trade policy. Now, uh, my general, the, a general comment I can make is that the government continues to negotiate to try and strike the future economic partnership to create the uh, withdrawal agreement. The Chequers deal, I believe, um, solves, crucially solves the, the Northern Irish issue, which is by far and away the most difficult part of this entire arrangement to get right. And it solves it in the way the Prime Minister always suggested, which is it solves by uh, through the future uh, economic partnership and, and how that will work. That, of course, seeks to create frictionless borders uh, and zero tariffs, which will answer the questions which you raise in that, in that the deal we seek is to do precisely or, or to, to mitigate the issues that you, you, you identify. Um, I believe that we will strike that deal. I believe it's in the interest of all the parties to do so. Uh, yes, there remains a realistic poss uh, possibility uh, of a no-deal Brexit, uh, but I continue to believe that much more likely is that both sides will come to, to this issue with pragmatic issues in mind about the potential consequences. We'll see that the future lies uh, in a close partnership between the two countries and we will see uh, success. Um, I mean, OK, I, I know what you're saying about um, directing questions to uh, DEX, but obviously are here representing the UK government, so um, slightly d disappointed with your, your, your answer there. Um, but um, Mike Russell, the Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations, who will be given evidence shortly, uh, wrote to David Livington on, uh, earlier this week, saying we have serious concerns that a no-deal outcome will magnify massively the uncertainties over Brexit. The Scottish Government believes that there are major questions over a range of vital matters, including customer arrangements, burdens on business imports and exports of plasma products, medicines and medical medical devices, the involvement of UK universities in programmes such as Erasmus Scheme and the future funding for UK aid organisations. Um, and he is asking, we would be grateful to know what arrangements uh, the UK government will be making to ensure that the devolved administrations are consulted and their views made known in advance of uh, this special cabinet meeting. Do you ha appreciate um, that, that letter was published earlier this week and, and, and not directed to you, but do you have any response to the, the concerns and issues? That I, I can only uh, mirror what I said, said before, Camina. Uh, uh, clearly, there will be consequences of a no deal, no deal Brexit. It is what we absolutely do not want to happen. I, I could reiterate what I said about my as analysis of, of the chance of success, but I, I'm sorry that you were disappointed with my response to the previous question. But this, what you're talking about here, the consequences of the effects of a particular sectoral interest uh, uh, over a no-deal Brexit is exactly what Dexy was set up to deal with, and it is absolutely their line of responsibility. Uh, and I just, it is not proper for me, I don't think, to comment on those particular details because those are very much their province, uh, and I'd be stepping over ministerial boundaries if I did so. 
Uh, it is perfectly reasonable for me to, to say that I don't think uh, we will hit that position. Very much hope that we will not, and very much hope we will have a very close relationship. But I'm not about to enter into setting policy or making comments upon a portfolio held by a different department. Okay. Um, thank you, Minister, for coming along with your, your officials today. Sorry, ap apologies, Patrick. I forgot. There's one, one other supplementary. I do one, apologise. One brief final question. Um, you are presumably hoping that any outstanding differences in relation to the trade bill that you have with the Scottish Government will be resolved, that they will recommend consent to the bill to this Parliament and that the Parliament will, will vote for consent. If that doesn't happen and Parliament doesn't consent to this bill, does the UK Government intend to respect that decision uh, and not impose uh, legislation in devolved areas without the consent of Parliament? I think the best I can say, Kavina, is that we will work very, very hard to make sure that we get that legislative consent motion. And will you respect the decision on consent made by this Parliament? I'll just repeat my previous answer. That's a no then. OK, well, thank you very much again for coming along this morning, Minister, with your, uh, with your officials. I hope you've enjoyed your first sojourn into the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I now suspend this meeting for five minutes to allow a changeover of witnesses.
Well, colleagues, uh, we'll, we'll now hear from our second panel of witnesses. Uh, firstly, Michael Russell, the Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations. Um, Francesca Morton, who's the Solicitor, and Stephen Sadler, who's the Head of the Trade Policy Team. I uh, welcome our witnesses to our session this morning, and I uh, will uh, invite the Minister to make any opening remarks he wished to do. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and thank you for the invitation to, to start off the, uh, the new session the way we finished the last session. I'm very pleased to be back at the Committee. Um, let me reflect very briefly on the background to this and on the Trade Bill itself. The events on legislative consent for the Withdrawal Act have effectively overturned 19 years of constitutional convention and practice. The UK Government sought this Parliament's consent and it was refused. The UK Government proceeded with its legislation, ignoring that view. If the UK Government believes it can proceed whatever the decision of this Parliament on consent, the Convention is of very little value in protecting this Parliament and the interests of this country. We are therefore seeking urgent discussions with the UK Government on how to strengthen and protect the Sewell Convention and of course we will discuss that next week. We will also be looking for discussions with the other parties on how to respond to these developments. But in the meantime we have made it clear we will not be bringing forward further legislative consent motions on Brexit bills. We will work with the UK Government to develop this trade bill to ensure Scottish interests are protected as far as we can. But we cannot in all conscience invite the Parliament to consider the issue of consent legislation if the UK Government reserves the right to set aside that view for all bills. The Trade Bill is designed to operate alongside other legislation to help ensure continuity in the UK's existing trade and investments arrangements with third countries by allowing steps to be taken to carry over or grandfather existing arrangements between the EU and third countries when the UK leaves the EU. The UK Government has said in most cases the implementation of any obligations within existing international trade agreements will be dealt with through the EU Withdrawal Bill. The Trade Bill deals with those circumstances where that will not be possible and confers powers on the Scottish Ministers and Parliament to do so in devolved areas in these cases. Our concerns about the Bill as introduced were set out in a Legislative Consent Memorandum last December. I am pleased to say there have been some changes made. The Bill will be considered in the House of Lords next week and it is a better one than the one that was introduced. But we still have significant concerns in two areas set out in Derek Mackay's letter to, of 28th June to Liam Fox, which I believe members of the committee have seen. The first was a direct read across to Section 12 and Schedules 2 and 3 of the EU Withdrawal Act, which gives Scottish ministers powers to make fixes to retained EU law. As things currently stand in the Trade Bill, as with the EU Withdrawal Act, Scottish ministers will have the power to amend direct retained EU legislation in areas that are otherwise devolved, but not where Section 12 UK framework regulations have been made by the UK Government. Our other concern, and I know you've been discussing this already this morning, is in relation to the Trade Remedies Authority. The TRA will have an important role in the development of UK trade policy. It will undertake trade remedies investigations across the UK, which will inevitably touch on devolved areas or areas of significance to Scotland. Its decisions could have a substantial impact on businesses and consumers in Scotland, yet despite repeated representations from us and the Welsh Government, neither the Trade Bill nor Taxation Cross-Border Trade Bill provides a role for the devolved administrations, for example, in relation to the appointment of board members. We will continue to press for the Bill to be amended to address these. The Trade Bill focuses on ensuring continuity through the rollover of existing arrangements. It does not deal, however, with the development of future trade arrangements. So let me conclude on that. Last week, Derek and I, Mackay and I published a discussion paper on Scotland's role in the development of future UK trade arrangements. Focusing on the decision-making processes underpinning them, the paper makes an evidence-based case for an overhaul of existing arrangements for developing, scrutinising and agreeing trade deals. The arrangements for agreeing trade deals are already inadequate, out of date, and in need of a radical overhaul, even if the UK continues as an EU member state and member of the customs union. That inadequacy can be seen in both the currently limited role of the UK Parliament and of the devolved institutions, a point made often to this committee and at Westminster during the course of the trade bill. The need for change becomes even more urgent if the UK leaves the customs union and the single market. Leaving the EU will fundamentally change the nature of the UK as a state and impact on the UK's current constitutional arrangements. Much has changed in the last 40 years, both within the UK and internationally. The scope and nature of trade deals themselves has changed considerably, from an initial focus on a limited range of issues such as tariffs, quotas and cooperation, to encompass a far broader range of issues affecting a wide range of devolved interests directly impacting on Scotland businesses and citizens. The development, conduct, conduct and content of future trade deals will therefore have very important implications for Scotland. 
The UK government has talked of trade deals that work for the whole of the UK, but Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland could have very different interests to the rest of the UK in some negotiations, or differences best addressed before reaching the negotiating table. The UK government's approach so far appears to place the interests and involvement of the devolved nations on a par with sectoral interests. That must change. We must have decision-making processes that recognise, respect and protect the economic and social interests of all four nations of the UK. Scotland wants to be a constructive partner to the other nations of the UK and a fair trading partner to countries around the world. To protect and promote Scotland's interests, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament must have a guaranteed role in all stages of the formulation, negotiation, agreement and implementation of future trade deals. The paper is, however, a discussion paper. When the paper describes what future involvement trade deals might look like, we recognise that others, including members of this committee, will have a role in shaping proposals. And I look forward to that process. Uh, thank you, Minister, for these opening remarks. Uh, but before I ask my first series of questions, I just want to clarify, did you see any of the evidence previously? I saw some of it. Okay. You may have seen the, the beginning of the evidence taking session in regard to how the current bill, trade bill, its clauses one and two replicates what was in um, section 12 of the mm. EU withdrawal bill. Um, I would like your reaction to what the minister said in that regard, but also in regard to the fact that in far, as far as existing trade arrangements are concerned um, and any potential change in these trade arrangements initiated by third party countries, um, no, no specific role being seen for either the Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament in overseeing, providing scrutiny, consultation, etc. Uh, what would, what's your reaction to that position? Well, my reaction is, is, is one of surprise, given the commitment that already exists within the JMC process, indeed accepted by the Prime Minister, that there should be a review of the uh, devolution arrangements, particularly the arrangements to, for consultation. I think everybody would accept that the, the weight of Brexit is too great for the current devolved settlement to bear. That's obvious. That's what's happened in the last uh, two years. And no matter what position you took on it, the system has not worked. And therefore, there needs to be changes to the system. Now, if you take a rational, evidence-based uh, approach to this, some of those changes would come in areas which have also changed substantially uh, since devolution w w first took place. And, and those include uh, trading arrangements. Trading arrangements, as I've indicated in my opening remark, uh, were at one stage very much and solely about issues of, of tariffs and borders. Trading arrangements now respect the domestic requirements of, of nations. If you look at Scotland, we regard ourselves as a, a moderate progressive nation with a particular interest, for example, in environmental issues. We would bring those to the table in any of the considerations that we have. Um, we think that there is a case to be made for substantial change, and I would make that case, and I would encourage people to discuss that case. And this is very much in parallel with what the Welsh Government put forward last year in terms, terms of how they saw devolution requiring to change. I, you know, I make no secret, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that I believe in independence. But if, if devolution remains the, the situation and the, the system under which we live, it is not adequate for the times, and it needs to change. And what we're doing is arguing a positive, constructive case for that change. We've published a paper for discussion. I think that should be seen as a positive issue. I, I'm not sure the ministers had time to read that paper. Uh, I'm happy to debate the t paper with them and to debate it with others. Uh, fi final question for me at this stage. Uh, as part of their initial evidence uh, session, the UK Minister for Trade Policy also emphasised what he saw as the meaningful engagement between officials and Scottish Government officials, for example, in relation to the TRA. Um, and, he, and he saw these as meaningful. What, what's your view of what these discussions have felt like and how, how often have they been? Well, I understand that the officials may meet each other today four times, but I don't think they've met each other for weeks and there will be no future plans to meet. I'm very, I have to say I'm, I'm pretty critical presently of the nature of that engagement. I think some of that engagement across governments is, is meaningful and, and has worked well. Uh, the deep dive, for example, have been driven forward. 
But when I see essentially a tick box exercise going on, then I have an obligation to say there is a tick box exercise going on. Uh, in, in any case, the quality of that engagement is a key issue, not the regularity. And is there a willingness to listen to and discuss changes that are required and to fully express in the work we do what was meant to be and promised to be a partnership of equals? Uh, and I don't see that. I mean, the white paper is an indication of that. Uh, you know, I, we went through a process in which we saw drafts of five chapters of the white paper. In fact, I only saw four. A, those drafts didn't bear a great relation to what eventually was in the white paper. But I did sit at a ministerial meeting at which a, two UK ministers read out the precy of a couple of those drafts because we as ministers and people on the table were not allowed to see them. I don't call the quality of that to be high. I felt as I was sitting in a, 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 a in a monastery being read at while you know things went around me. That's not a quality of representation. Now, to be fair, I doubt whether those two ministers had themselves seen the white paper. Uh, you know, and I think part of this is a culture of extreme centralisation in the current UK government and a culture of extreme chaos. But I don't believe the quality of engagement is presently meaningful. Okay, Adam Tompkins. Um, thanks, Kavina. Um, Minister, it won't surprise you to know that I want to um, get into the issues in a bit more detail today that were raised by me and yesterday in the chamber, which you chose not to respond to on that occasion. Um, this time last year, you and I were agreed that um, Brexit can and must be delivered compatibly with the United Kingdom's devolution settlements. Why do you no longer hold to that view? Why is it now your view that the United Kingdom's devolution settlements need to be changed, which is what you've just told us, uh, in order to bear the weight of Brexit? Well, they're not mutually incompatible positions. I believe that you know, the current devolved settlement needs to be observed. Uh, but I do believe it is possible also to say that there are parts of that that need to be improved because they don't work. An example is the Sewell Convention. You know, the Sewell Convention is shown not to work. Uh, we've seen that in, in recent months. Uh, you know, consent means consent, even if we say it isn't consent. So in those circumstances, there needs to be a change. But uh, of course, what is happening at the present moment has to be delivered according to the current settlement, but we can envisage a better settlement. So it is, a, the, it is, if I may finish, it is a dynamic work in progress. Under the current settlement, international uh, relations, international treaties and international trade are reserved to the United Kingdom Parliament, aren't they? Uh, it, it, they are reserved, but of course there is an operation, a way in which they have operated has tended to be much more relaxed okay. than the, um, the definition that you're giving. And of course, the definition that was given by the Advocate General in the uh, Supreme Court case was a, an, a quite a considerable narrowing of that definition. And I think it's right for us to point out that that is a worrying development. It's been pointed out by the other devolved administrations as well. So you accept that international trade is a reserved competence in which uh, Scotland's interests are represented by 59 MPs that Scotland elects to uh, Westminster? No, I, I, I accept that the devolution process is one that is dynamic and has continued to change. I do not accept there is a hierarchy of governments that's, as we exist within the devolution settlement. And I think because there are responsibilities that the devolved administrations have, they should be represented uh, in trade talks. That's the position I'm taking. I, I'm not... I mean, Richard Keane's position on the on the um, international uh, obligations will be tested in the Supreme Court. And you know, the yeah, judgment I mean, of the Supreme Court will be... Will, will I, I don't, say something I don't, about I don't think it's wise for us um, to speculate on the record about what the Supreme Court might well, say in a case which is live I before it. So. Um, so I'm not going to um, okay. accept the invitation to reflect on arguments that were put um, before an independent judicial body uh, minister, if that's all right with you. Um, the, uh, the point, though, is this, that in your paper published last week or the week before, jointly with uh, Mr Mackay, um, uh, you have proposed um, that Scottish ministers should have a, an effective veto in every stage of the preparation, negotiation, mandating, ratification and signing of future trade agreements for all future trade agreements, notwithstanding the fact that these are reserved competences. How is that standing up for the devolution settlement, which you and I were agreed 12 months ago needed to be done throughout the Brexit process. The reason I didn't respond to this yesterday is because I, I wanted to have the opportunity to do so properly in this debate. So thank you for, for raising it, because it's the point you raised yesterday. The only veto that exists in the devolution settlement is that from the UK government. There is no other veto. 
because in the devolution settlement, the actions of any devolved administration can be vetoed by the UK government. There is no means by which, either in this paper or in anything that exists or anticipated under devolution, that we could veto uh, the decisions of the UK government. So uh, that is regrettably a mistaken uh, impression you have, and I'm glad to be able to correct it. The reality of the situation is that in this paper, we do suggest there are areas in which it would be important to have the agreement of the Scottish government. Just as to take a... To, to, I'm, I'm sorry, as, but you don't say important. You say, re you don't well, say important. You say ag agreement required. Yes, you, yes. Have, you have listed in Annex B on page 62 I of have. your paper five instances where the agreement of no, not only the Scottish Government but also the Scottish Parliament will be required in your view, required in your view, uh, for a future trade agreement to be um, uh, even prepared, never mind negotiated, never mind uh, ratified or signed. Now, you know, agreement required is the definition of a veto, because if the agreement is then not given, there is an effective veto. That, well, no, no, that would only be the case. Or required case, doesn't mean required. This is not a debate, that would, folks. So let's get this questions and answers, please. The, that would only be the case if, if that uh, agreement was withheld, as it if it was withheld for good reasons, and that uh, withholding agreement was final. It would not be final in these circumstances. But you treat uh, you treat agreement as something that's confrontational. I would treat agreement as being something that we would <laughs> that we would seek to find because we have and continue to seek to find agreement. And it's not unreasonable to say that, for example, on matters of agriculture, where that is within a trade deal, that the devolved administrations, which have responsibility for agriculture, should be involved in that process and should agree to that process. Uh, the issue, uh, I think it was Emma Harper who raised it earlier, but it's taken a few 20 minutes or so to bring it in here. The issue of chlorinated chicken refers. Uh, the issue of uh, hormone-fed beef refers. There are circumstances in which we would not agree to those. Now, in the end, the UK could, uh, it could, unless Scotland is independent, the UK could impose that. But seeking agreement would be the thing that you would do to sit down and negotiate. I know the current UK government is incapable of negotiating agreement, but we're not incapable of negotiating agreement, and I'm quite sure that that could be uh, found. I don't think it's at all unreasonable. But in addition, this is a discussion paper. You may say that you would want to change the word required, say agreement would be sought. That would be good because then the UK government would be able to seek agreement for matters that were our responsibility. Perhaps that's the change you would like to see in the well, paper. I, I welcome those remarks, Minister, because those remarks are much more conciliatory than the very angry tone that you've taken in the paper that you published um, a, a, a week ago. You don't talk in that paper about the United Kingdom government seeking your agreement. You talk about the United Kingdom being required to uh, required not to proceed with reserved competence unless and until it first has your agreement, and that is a very different set of issues. But the point remains this. A year ago, you were all for defending the devolution settlement, and we supported you in that. Now you've changed your tune, and you want to attack the devolution settlement because you don't believe that international trade should remain a reserved competence. Isn't that long and the short well, of it? I, I, it's not a great surprise to anybody here that I, I would prefer independence to devolution. But I think putting forward constructive proposals to develop the devolution settlement in the light of in the light of the chaos that we have seen and the difficulties that Brexit has created for devolution should be seen as a constructive act because what we're trying to do is to say devolution does not work. And my goodness me, I think the evidence of that is all around. So what we're trying to say is there's different ways to do this. Now, I, I mean, I have read this paper and reread this paper and even edited this paper. I don't think it's angry in any place. What it is is trying to put forward a constructive set of proposals to improve devolution. There are those who would attack me for doing so because I would be expected only to talk about independence. So I seem to be caught between a rock and a hard place here. But I do think this debate is a useful one to have. The Welsh are having it. We're having it. Um, I don't think it's inconsistent to defend what exists now, but to say it could be improved, that would seem to be rational. Patrick Harvey. What the... Um Sorry, good morning. Uh, what the um, Scottish Government has said is that the devolved, administration, uh, devolved institutions, I stress institutions, government as well as parliament, must play an enhanced role in the development of future trade policy. That's actually very similar to what the UK Government has said in its paper on future trade policy, that there must be a, a role for the devolved uh, institutions. <clears throat> is there a way of framing that in a clear, comprehensible manner that allows decision-making, uh, that recognises that this is an area of shared responsibility where cooperation and compromise will be needed on both sides, 
and where each institution has the ability to determine whether sufficient compromise has been reached without getting into uh, the, the kind of dynamic that we've just seen where people are angrily counting the number of vetoes. Yes, and there's an example that you could use. Uh, you could, use, you could, you could use the example of the Canadian Trade Treaty, and you could use the example of the uh, federal uh, um, the, 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 the provinces in Canada being involved in that negotiation and having to be at the table because the negotiation is about responsibilities that they have. There seem to be two examples that are taken from the Canadian experience. That's the positive example, where you can in actual have the range of provinces with the federal government sitting there discussing this with the EU and coming to a conclusion. The negative take has been the UK government's take, which is terrified of what happened at the, at the ratification stage with the, the, the Wallonia parliament saying that they had reservations, which was perfectly natural and which was overcome. Uh, so I think there's an example before us that you can move in that direction and have that work. Now, you would need a willingness to do so. We've put on the table some ideas to do so. If there are other ideas about how that can be refined, we're very open to those ideas. You've also given a, a, a fairly clear indication that you favour more parliamentary scrutiny in mm -hmm. general, not just in relation to yep. the devolved institutions. Uh, for example, in uh, you know, maintaining to some extent, perhaps even building on the level of parliamentary scrutiny that's operated in the European Parliament, which won't operate uh, under the UK government's plans in uh, the UK Parliament. Is it reasonable then for us to assume that in whatever level of engagement there exists between the UK government and the Scottish government, the Scottish government will persistently seek the agreement of the Scottish Parliament uh, for the decisions that it takes in relation to those discussions? Yes. What's the mechanism for us to ensure that that happens? Well, I think that that's within the paper. There's some discussion of what that, that mechanism should be. But I would have thought that, that there would be stages in the process in which we would seek parliamentary agreement or authority. There would also be committee scrutiny, which actually would be a pretty powerful part of it. I mean, trade deals, by definition, are complex. Uh, and in, therefore, you would want to make sure that the decision-making process was on the principles that were applied, not necessarily on every sub-paragraph. But committee scrutiny would be important, parliamentary scrutiny would be important, and parliamentary decision-making would be important. So if, for example, uh, a UK government doesn't agree that the Scottish government should be able to uh, have to ag agree or disagree to a negotiating mandate for a future trade agreement, but is willing to discuss that mandate uh, with the Scottish government, the Scottish Government will also be able to discuss it with the Scottish Parliament, will not be inhibited from discussing that with the Scottish Parliament and seeking parliamentary approval for its approach. No, I, I agree. I think that would be the right way to do it. And, of course, we've shown that example in what we did on the continuity bill, which was very much a product of discussion and debate. And, indeed, that bill was developed as it went through Parliament because there was a willingness to do so. So, I mean, I think that's, that's exactly where I'd find myself. And just finally, in relation to the, the, the shorter term issues within the, the trade bill uh, in terms of if, if Brexit is done uh, and the, the desire to, to have continuity of existing arrangements, a great emphasis when, from the previous session from uh, the, the UK minister uh, was that there will be no substantial or very few substantial changes. Is there any discussion that's taken place between the two governments about the scenario in which uh, the UK government thinks that a change is not substantial, but the, the Scottish government thinks that it is substantial, and how that difference would be resolved? No, um, there hasn't been that discussion, uh, I, and I think it's a topic that needs to be addressed. But uh, a, as usual, the present structures would seem to me to find it very difficult to resolve those, because at the end of the day, the UK government makes those decisions. You know, and the UK government definitions. It's like the definition of the word consent. It, it, it is defined by the UK government. So, so we have no confidence no, then that, I don't. Uh, that the UK government's commitment that there will be no substantial or significant no. changes, you, you don't believe that? No, I, I, I have very little confidence in that, I'm afraid to say. I mean, I'm being straight about that. Okay. Alexander, Common Frameworks. Uh, I just wonder if the uh, Cabinet Secretary would like to yeah, give us an update, maybe after a summer, of any progress that's been made in his contribution uh, to the Common Frameworks. Well, I know that the uh, officials answered this um, uh, with the Trade Minister, um, and he 
they referred to the discussion of the Secretary of State. From our side, the, the deep dives have continued. Uh, there have been no Section 12 <coughs> orders as yet, which I regard as a, as a positive step. Um, and, you know, we continue to discuss the, uh, the areas where we think that we can work together. Uh, you know, I do not believe that Section 12 orders are the right things to do. And therefore, if we can find ways to establish those frameworks without Section 12 orders, I, we've made it absolutely clear that we will do so. And that work is continuing. Uh, and we have not reached a, an impasse as yet on any of those. Thank you. Just an addition about common frameworks. I mean, we have a s unique differences in we have our fishing and our agriculture in Scotland, and so Scotland needs to have the ability to contribute quite effectively into trade negotiations when we're talking about common frameworks and further, I guess, agricultural aspects. So, how can we um, be assured that we have the ability to communicate effectively what the unique issues are with the requirements for common frameworks moving forward? The outcome of a common framework in the areas where they think be required may or may not be legislative. You know, I mean, that's, that's clearly been the debate up until now. If you look at agriculture, there is progress being made on an agriculture bill, the Brexit agricultural bill. And therefore, the issue you're addressing is germane to that, is that discussion on the UK agriculture bill making progress and understanding that. Now, so far, so good. Uh, you know, that discussion continues. Um, uh, when it is at its conclusion and a bill is published, we will see whether that discussion has produced the correct fruit or not. Uh, you know, in, in, I'm not sure it's a complete agricultural term, but you know, that's what we're looking for to find out. Um, so far, that discussion continues. That's the product of the deep dives. Uh, it is also the product of ensuring that there is uh, continuing dialogue on those matters. If we got to the stage where there was a Section 12 order or a bill, you know, which essentially took powers that it should not take, that would be the the hard moment. We're not at that moment as yet, but it takes a lot of work from a lot of people uh, to make that happen. And we need to make sure that the frameworks are agreed and not imposed on Scotland. Isn't that one of the well, that's key That's exactly aspects? the thing. And that's, it's the outcomes of that that are important. For example, an agriculture bill that can be agreed and recognises the roles of the uh, devolved administrations and does not impinge upon those. That's, that's vital. Okay, thanks. What about you? areas to do with um, PGA? Yes, um, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, I don't know if you saw the previous exchange I had with um, the uh, UK Trade Minister around uh, GPA. I don't know if you have any specific concerns around GPA. My understanding of what um, Mr Hollingbury said to us was all that's happening here is that uh, the, the, the UK, which is currently part of the GPA uh, through the EU, is replacing that with direct involvement. Is that something the Scottish Government are, are content with as an approach? Well, yes. I mean, we are already in the GPA because we're a member through the EU. Um, I, I've met last year with officials involved with the GPA, and you know they were starting that process of, of, of making the transfer. I, I was slightly concerned with one of the answers you got from an official, which seemed to imply that the, um, the trade opportunities, the opportunities to, to bid for public procurement contracts, would be something new. Uh, they're not new. You know, they already exist under the EU, and indeed the official admitted to you that it would be they are seeking to replicate the UK terms. So the, the EU terms, there would be no difference in that regard. It does seem a lot of work, however, is going to be required on both sides to get to where um, they already are. But the opportunities that the GPA pr present uh, to, to businesses within this country will not change, providing they are able to secure the same terms, and that's not guaranteed. So one does wonder why this is going on. Okay, and, and just about the same question too that I put to, to Mr. Hollingbury around around procurement issues. You know, we've heard various claims being made that you know future trade deals will open up the the, the NHS in Scotland to uh, bids from American companies, and we're all going to be uh, force-fed chlorinated chicken, and that will be part of the food chain. And we heard very clearly from from the UK Trade Minister that this is nonsense, and that's not going to happen. Do you accept that? No. I don't accept So he's it. not telling the truth? No, no, I'm not saying he's not telling the truth. I mean, he may, as an individual, be telling you exactly what he believes to be true. I believe the system that will come into place will make it considerably easier uh, in terms of, of trading for those things to, to, to happen. Because the people who are um, influencing this, and they will be politicians such as ourselves, there are many of those whose uh, interests lie in ensuring those things do happen. Uh, it is also in the interest of the countries that are seeking the trade deals to push what they want to happen. And I, I fear that the expertise in the UK in trade deals will be considerably lessened by not being in the EU. And the weight 
uh, available in those trade deals will be considerably lessened. And that's a big issue. You know, trade is not solely about the biggest stick, but sometimes it is about the biggest stick. And having that debate doesn't mean, you know, say we will not have chlorinated chicken. The weight against that from the United States, which has not been behaving exactly, you know, um, uh, charmingly in these matters in, in recent times, uh, will be great. So I, I do not accept the assertions, not because I doubt his word, but because I think the whole system and the weight of the system will be uh, against uh, where we are now. And we have weight on our side now. You know, it is a European issue not to have chlorinated chicken. It is a European issue, which is, you know, as we saw with the TTIP uh, 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 treaty, it's a European issue. The people of Europe were very substantially against the weakening of the system that would have destroyed uh, public, uh, certain public services. So I, I think there is a danger in there. But with respect, Mr. Russell, I mean, the UK Trade Minister could not have been clearer in mm -hmm. his answer to me. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, there will be no diminution of mm -hmm. free food standards, and there's no question of our public services being opened up to international competition. I don't understand why you can't accept him as his word. Well, I, I, I am being absolutely clear with you. I'm not accusing him of lying. I just think that the system, the changes to the system, will immensely weaken our ability to stop those things happening. So you have two divergent points of view. People will have to choose between them. You still get it as a GPA. Just in terms of future trade deals, um, what's, what you, what's your view in terms of devolved administrations being able to opt out in relation to where contracts are, are involved in Scottish public bodies, say, for example, on something like the living wage? Well, I think it would be important, and, and this relates to the issue I raised earlier about the wider context of trade deals. Uh, you know, a trade deal, you know, 19th century trade deal is about tariffs. It, you know, even an early 20th century trade deal is about tariffs. It is about borders. You know, trade deals, 21st century trade deals, are about a wider range of things. And they, are, they should be about public protection. They should be about social standards. They should be about environmental standards. And those are things that we should, we should put into them. And that's the type of trade discussions not only we would want to have, but we'd want to influence you know, the EU to have. And increasingly, that is the case. Um, they are also about things like data. I mean, I noticed yesterday um, a piece of news which said that the, the last stages of the new EU arrangement with Japan were being put into place, which, and those stages were uh, the, the Japanese assuring the EU about the data standards that they had so that Japanese companies and others could be involved in data processes and, 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 and data handling. Now, that is about a trade deal. You know, and that's very high standards of regulation uh, that, in actual fact, protect citizens. So that's extremely important, too. And we need to make sure that we are in control of that, and particularly the areas for which we, as a parliament and a government, are responsible. You know, that, that is our, where those things are our responsibility. We should be the people who are making those decisions. I mean, I would have thought that's axiomatic. OK, um, Willie, you wanted to cover TRA still? Yeah, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Bruce, uh, I don't know if you heard the discussion we had on the TRA with, with the Minister and I asked him about representation on that board for any of the devolved administrations and well, I, I, I take it, he ruled that out. But I then went on to ask, well, and whoever you appoint to that body, will you assure us that they at least have some experience or knowledge of the devolution settlement and powers and so on? And he appeared to rule that out as well. So what's your view on that? And does, it, does it look that we could have a, a board of adjudicators that don't know anything about what they're adjudicating on? Yes, it is. I was disappointed in his response. This remains you know, an issue in which we are seeking amendment to the bill, along with the, the Welsh government, uh, because it's necessary. There is a very easy answer to this, of course, you know, which there is an amendment in place which would solve it. But there's actually practice within public appointments that makes this easy to, to deal with, which is to sh ensure that there is, within the person specification, on that board at least two individuals, one of whom has a substantial knowledge of the Scottish economy and the Scottish trading and Scottish market. Another one has the same knowledge of Wales. And you might want one with Northern Ireland as well, depending on what happens in that settlement. That's normal in personal specifications. If you see advertisements for public bodies, you know, there are, there are key specifications for members of public bodies, uh, and that should be applied. So I just can't see the difficulty here. The argument that this should be solely on merit seems to apply that the, the knowledge of Scottish uh, uh, trade in some way would uh, not be as meritorious as having some other qualification. Now, I think the, the, the person specif at the very least, the person's specification for these appointments should include 
individuals uh, who are nominated on the grounds that they have this knowledge as well as a wider knowledge. I mean, this is, this is also you know, common practice for generations. They used to have, uh, I'm sure the convener will remember this, they used to have in, in the Deer Commission uh, particular categories of membership. Uh, one member had to have a knowledge of Deer issues in the south of Scotland, and I seem to remember that it was always difficult to appoint to that one. You know, so this is not new. And I really, what I read from the minister was simply a refusal to accept that uh, they should be thinking about the issues of the Scottish economy, the Welsh economy and the Northern Irish economy. Mm. Is that another example of what you said at the beginning, Cabinet Secretary, about this whole process effectively overturning 19 years of the devotion settlement? Uh, yes, I think what it's about is a lack of, of recognition of reality. You know, this is not the country that it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. It, it's changed. Devolution changed things and recognising that change. Now, this is not, you know, you, wouldn't, you would expect me to say it, but you perhaps wouldn't expect, you know, the um, the PAC Act committee to say it in its report. Uh, you know, uh, I know that you've met with Bernard Jenkins, and and that report makes it clear that that lack of knowledge of devolution is a is an issue and a problem. Neil, yeah, uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, minister. Um, you've written to David Lindington to outline some of um, your very reasonable concerns about the impact of a no deal Brexit. Um, there's obviously a great deal of concern about a shortage of goods that could uh, happen if, as a result of a no deal Brexit uh, that could hit the UK economy. But I'm interested to know what the specific impact could be on the on, on the Scottish economy. Um, uh, Mr. Hollingbury uh, said he wasn't in a position to, to to respond to that point. But I know in your your, your letter you have uh, outlined a number of areas in which. Um, you, you have concerns over um, what? What are the specific areas that are you know will have a disproportional effect on on Scotland? Well, there's, there's a number. I mean, there's a legislative burden that this is, this Parliament is going to have to meet. You know, so we are already locked into that. We are going to have to do a considerable amount of additional work between now and uh, and next March, and that's simply uh, the reality. I think of perhaps of greater importance is the the the. Rec the dawning realisation in some sectors, they're also going to have to make exceptional preparations. If you look at the medical side, you know, it has been well publicised that there will have to be a stockpiling of drugs. I mean, it's extraordinary we're at this stage, but that will have to happen. And there are discussions taking place between Gene Freeman's department and the Department of Health about how that will be mm -hmm. handled and, and exactly what our role will be in that, and, and that's ongoing. There are issues in food supply, both food supply coming in. I mean, nobody's suggesting there'll be an, an end to food. But, you know, there is a pinch point at Dover. Uh, you know, a great deal of the food supplies we have come here. If there were to be disruption to trade at Dover, then there would be a knock-on effect. And, of course, the further you are from Dover, the greater that knock-on effect. There is an issue for businesses, and particularly businesses that are involved in foodstuffs, perishable foodstuffs, going the other way. An example I often use in my own constituency is shellfish. You know, if shellfish is going to, to France, leaving it on the hard shoulder of the M20 for three or four days isn't conducive to making it better, put it that way. So there are issues in there. But we, one of the big issues is we don't know. I mean, I think reasonable people would say every effort will be made to avoid a no deal. But it is being talked up by the UK government, you know, again and again. And, and some people believe, I was talking to a very senior MEP some time ago about this, some people believe there is a dynamic within the system that once people like the financial sector and others prepare for a no deal, it becomes more likely because you know, people are, are actually hedging against there being a, a no deal and making their preparations. So we are locked into a, an extraordinary set of circumstances. There are things we just don't know, like ports and arrangements at ports. Uh, you, know, you can make lots of arrangements, but what happens you know, if you suddenly have to put into place a customs inspection and you don't have enough people and enough facilities to put in place a customs inspection? So we will do, as a government, everything we can to do two things. One is to avoid a no deal, because we keep saying this should not happen. But the other one is to make sure that what preparation and protection we can put in place, we will put in place. And that's a job for the whole parliament. You know, and, and quite clearly we will work with everybody to try and do so. But it is fair to say I don't think any government will be able to put in place everything that is required. Partly because we don't we will not know what everything is required. Thanks. Okay, I just I've got a process question at, at, at this stage, um, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you're already, the government's already put forward a legislative consent memorandum in regard to the trade bill. Um, and we heard what you said at the beginning of the process in regard to LCMs. Um, does that mean in these circumstances 
given that there have been some changes to the bill, that there will be no supplementary legislative consent memorandum from the, from the Scottish Government, and in which case are we expected to rely on the letter which Derek Mackay sent to Liam Fox on the 28th of June as being the position of the Scottish Government? And it, is, it is. I mean, you know, let's, let's not say never. You know, I have proposals that the Scottish Government will want to make to the UK Government about Sewell. You know, a, a, I would have hoped, and I have had conversations with the UK government about Seoul. I would hope that there might be some thinking there that things could change. If that was to change, then the issue of legislative consent would change too. Uh, I think the timing of that would be quite crucial. You know, the, the legislative consent process for this bill you know, has, to, has to take its course. But presently, the position that Derek has outlined and the position I have outlined in terms of why we will take these actions is quite clear. Okay. Now, the, I should point out, you know, we recognise, for example, that on secondary legislation for a no-deal option, we require to do certain things and you know, we will do them, but the Brexit bills themselves are, are an issue and will remain an issue until we have a sole process that we can rely on. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, can I just... I mean, just, just, just seeking clarification about this. I mean, I understand why the government has taken the position that it has taken, and I don't want to interrogate that, although we can get into it if you want. Um, I, I'm just trying to understand. I, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to understand the process. Um, uh, so, um, I didn't really understand your answer to the convener's question. Will there be a supplementary legislative consent memorandum for this bill or not? Um, I, I, at the present moment, not. But I'm, 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 you know, I'm open okay. at the present moment. I mean, I think that's something that we would want to discuss and also discuss with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, okay. it's, you know, it's, it's not a situation any of us like. Sure. And it, I'm happy to discuss it both with this committee and cross-party because we've done that before. Okay. So, so if if, it's, if the current position is that there probably won't be a supplementary legislative consent memorandum for this bill, do I take it that there won't be a government-sponsored legislative consent motion for this bill? Mm-hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Yes. So does that mean that Parliament will not have the opportunity to express whether or not it consents to this bill? Well, as whether or not it consents is, is in the UK terms, irrelevant, you know, because it would be taken as consent anyway, I, I suppose that would be the case. But I am, I am open to discussion as to whether the Parliament would wish an opportunity to say that it refuses legislative consent. We did that with the, uh, with the withdrawal bill. Um, you know, we didn't have to do that with the withdrawal bill, but we did it with the withdrawal bill. It may well be that you know, the view of many is that we should uh, debate it, in which case I suppose we would then bring a supplementary uh, legislative consent memorandum. But it is fluid at the moment because there, is still the ch there are still the changes to the bill that we've suggested. And I would want to see what happened with those. I'm disappointed by what we've heard from the Trade Minister this morning, but you know, there is still the opportunity for a change of heart. And there's opportunity for a change of heart in the soul. Okay. Uh, you know, both of those would be helpful. Okay. Um, and, and, and going forward, thinking about you know, future um, likely Brexit-related bills on, for example, agriculture, mm -hmm. um, is it the government's current position that um, there won't be a legislative consent memorandum in respect of future um, Brexit-related legislation? I don't think it's a hard and fast position. The hard and fast position is that we will not recommend a legislative consent motion on those. But uh, we, I think we're under an obligation to bring forward our reasoning on that. Yeah. So I think we would bring forward our reasoning on it. That would be the normal process. I can't see why we would uh, uh, refuse to do so. So you, you would anticipate that there would, be li there would likely be mm -hmm. future legislative consent memorandums mm -hmm. on the basis of which committees such as this could take evidence yes. and, and yes. report? Yes. If the, if the issue is the, the committee involvement, yes. Okay. So it's not, it's not a complete withdrawal from the Scottish Government in the entire LCM process? Uh, no, it is, it's a good point, and I think it's useful we clarify it. We are not resiling from the process within this Parliament and the involvement of this Parliament. We are seeking to ensure that this Parliament understands the position the Government has taken, and we seek the support of the Parliament and the position that the Government has undertaken. But we are not intending to recommend a legislative consent motion on any of the Brexit bills. Well, Is that you. clear? Thank you. Good. That's, that's very helpful and very clear. Thank you, Minister. Um, we now are moving into private, so um, I thank our witnesses for their contribution this morning. I'm very grateful. <laughs>